Hey there, my name is Mike Joseph. I host and produce Detoxicity, which is the podcast that you were just about to listen to. I hope that you have been listening and enjoying uh, for the entire time that we've been doing this. If you are new, welcome. If you are a listener of long standing, welcome again and thank you. Um, I appreciate the fact that you listen to this podcast. If you listen and enjoy, please feel free to leave a comment. Please feel free to rate on iTunes or any other podcast platforms that have the ability to rate. And please subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. Also, I would love it. It's not a requirement, but I would love it if you followed me on social media. I am on Twitter at TizMikeJoseph. That is T-I-S-M-I-K-E-J-O-S-E-P-H. And I'm on Instagram at DetoxPodGuy. I don't need to spell that out for anybody. I'm also on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok. But you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. And if you would like to be on the show or you know somebody who'd be a good fit for an interview on the show, feel free to reach out to me via either of those two platforms. Or you can drop me an old-fashioned email, detoxpod at gmail.com. Once again, that is detoxpod at gmail.com. Again, thank you for listening. I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy. This episode's guest is Nick Kazernis, my second recent guest based out of Dayton, Ohio. Nick is a musician and a software designer. Our conversation covers his careers and what it's like to live in those two very divergent worlds. We also talk about the allure of smaller town life. People love Dayton. Nick's investment in community, how the creative process works for him. Hint, it involves getting up at an ungodly hour, but he's cool with that and the things that he's learning from his two teenage children. And also, you might learn the secret of what it's like to be married for 23 years. Anyway, check Nick out. So, hi, Mike. I'm, my name's Nick. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. I'm, I'm a songwriter and guitar player for most of my life. I'm also a husband and a father of uh, two great kids who are just about a young adults now. And I'm also a user experience uh, designer and uh, have been for the past 25 years. So I, I lead a double life of uh, design and, and, and information technology, but also in writing songs and collaborating with musicians and, and recording records. So uh, lived all my life in Dayton, Ohio, and have been really fortunate that want to have wonderful friends and wonderful opportunities. And, and family have uh, come my way for all of my decades of, <laughs> of life on earth. So thanks for having me. This is of course. Uh, looking forward uh, to you again. Yeah, I, Dayton, Ohio is apparently a pretty happening spot. You're the second person I've interviewed from Dayton. People, people that apparently are from there like it there and they stay there. Yeah, it is. It has one of the largest Air Force bases. So there's a lot of people that come in there used to be a lot more industry there, has a history of innovation. So it's when you you might look at it from the outside and think it's it's like the thing that's in between Cincinnati and, and, and Columbus, right? The cool cities, which they are cool cities, but it's like when you land in Dayton, there's a lot of really nice, nice people and a lot of interesting things, right? I, I don't know if I ever thought I was gonna stay, but things just sort of unfolded that way and in both music and career and family to where like things just kind of kept happening and I've always appreciated Dayton but it is so interesting like you hear about the history of innovation but from my perspective I've got 20 30 years of <laughs> a rich musical history and creative history of, of amazing people and it just keeps on you know happening and that that's really exciting you know it is people me <laughs> sometimes thinks that it may not be possible to have a co successful career as a creative unless you're living in a major art or music hub mm -hmm. and you're able to do it and you've never felt the pull to move enough to actually move uh when or where did that fire get lit like when as little Nick, did you decide that, because I'm assuming the love for music came before the love for computers. It, it did, and it came before computers. <laughs> right, right, you know, I'm sure. The Commodore 64s or whatever, but it's, uh, <laughs> So my mom was a music teacher and my sister played piano and there was always music in the house. My dad was a big fan of really rock and roll, right? So that's sort of that, the 1950s as, 
country music and jazz and blues. And he was a big Elvis Presley fan and Johnny Cash and all of this stuff. And so there was a lot of that in the house. And then as I started discovering the sort of the classic rock and then the punk rock, like it's just waves. I remember being in the car hearing Queen and David Bowie on the on the AM radio in the back seat, and then my friend's older brother who played the Dead Kennedys and Black Flag for us, you know, as a teen or preteen, and around the same time picking up the guitar and suddenly realizing it was like a flash. It was like this is it, you know. So I think 12, 13 years old, picked up the guitar. And there's never been a day when I haven't had it right here and played it. It just became a thing, you know? So like everything I would see at that time, whether it be the David Bowie or the Who or Pink Floyd, and then the Ramones and the Replacements and the Clash, was just like wave after wave of inspiration. Not as much for the sort of like a big pageantry of, of like rock and roll, but just how loud and aggressive and, well, aggressive isn't quite the right word, the impact it would have. The sure. sort of like emotional impact like those things would have, like for hearing The Who or hearing The Clash, right? So it's not like a, aggressive isn't really the, really the right word because I like a lot of very quiet music as well. But music that has a lot of impact and I was just really taken by that. And I think by like every band I've ever been, every song I've ever written has been sort of like a quest for that. And that's something you can only do is you, you have to learn how to play music and improve and work with people and learn. And so for me, that's been sort of like a lifelong thing. Like, how about this? What about this? And, and that's how it started. Like wondering what in the world was Pete Townsend playing, you know, right. and going from there. It sounds like music was an outlet for you. Uh, I, I mean, I remember being a, a young kid and I was, you know, like a cartoonist. And then I was kind of dabbling and trying to write. And I, I realized I had a, you know, an ability to do that. And then I really couldn't pick up on the piano. I, but somehow I got that guitar. And right after that, started trying to write songs with my friend. And it became the outlet. Yeah, for and sure. Was it, was it a teenage angst thing? Or was it a way to kind of manage? I mean, let me retrace that a little bit. When you're a teenager, your brain is in a weird place and every teenager is sort of angsty and, 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 and riddled with anxiety in, in the best of situations. Were you drawn to music to kind of figure stuff going on in yourself out? Or was it just feeling like the power of music or, or watching a concert and seeing the power that music had over large crowds of people? How did it speak to you? So or in what specific ways did it speak to you? There's definitely angst going on, but I, I don't remember ever being like, oh, I have to get this message out or this feeling out. Although I'm sure that, yeah, yes, that does happen. But for me, it was, it was a lot of discovery about like, how does it work? How can I do that? And it wasn't as much of like saying, I want to play on a big stage someday, but that whole feeling of catharsis from seeing a really amazing show or artist or thing like that, I, I wanted to have that experience all the way around. I wanted to be able to experience what I thought maybe they were experiencing. And maybe that comes out through an angsty song, or maybe that comes out through learning how to play something or make a certain sound. I became really interested in what sounds were like, which for a lot of people who create very loud music, you start working with the sonic properties of like what's happening to your skull when you're like, you know. Yeah. Just became really interested in all of that. And so it started incorporating, going from like, starting from early rock roots rock and roll moving through Beatles and then into punk rock and then more experimental and psychedelic music and just kept on trying these different styles but it's like having that experience how can we create that what does it take to create it right and the more I got into it the more there was oh there more there is to learn you yeah. know by the time you discover Miles Davis or something you're like what you know <laughs> so I remember hearing Mingus and Coltrane and, and Miles Davis, like a lot of those 50s albums, and then suddenly shifting gear to Jack Johnson or Bitches Brew. And I, I mean, I know people who play a lot like jazz. I dabble in it, but I'm not a jazz musician. But I loved just exploring it and learning it and incorporating it back into that need for expression, which may or may not be angsty at times. <laughs> All right, that's a good way to tie that up. That actually really makes a lot of sense. So... 
were you ever like, I want to be a rock star or did you, because I don't know if anybody ever has the practical sense of, I'll play in a band on the weekends, but then I'm going to get a corporate job during the week so that I can uh, have a stable lifestyle. Yeah. I don't know if any 16 year old does that. Were you like, I'm going to dress like Kiss and or, or dress like Joey Ramone and, and go on stage and make money as a rock star? Or were you more practical, I guess I should say? Well, it was definitely more practical because I think a lot of the big influences on us were like the torn jeans and t-shirts and maybe the leather jackets rather than the makeup and platform boots. Although that stuff was very cool. And, and also because it wasn't an idea of fame and fortune, right? My thought was, could this be a working class living? Could I be a working musician? And so the idealistic view of it is like, well, I'm going to be in a successful band. And certainly in the 80s, you saw a lot of bands who were squeaking out the living. And they were huge role models. Bands like Husker Du and the Minutemen and all these bands that were like starting to establish themselves. And as, as some of those bands started getting on larger labels, and you knew that they weren't rock stars because probably people were really struggling. Even people like The Replacements and Paul Westerberg probably weren't making near the amount of money that you would think that they would make. But I always thought, oh, if I could you know, make the equivalent of working in a record store full time or, or waiting tables. If I could make a living and I'm playing music and traveling and recording, that would be great. But as you do that, you start to find out that it's a pretty narrow, uh, you know, window there. But the more self-sufficient you are, the more opportunities we actually had. So the more we took it upon ourselves. Pre-internet, there were actually more opportunities to make your own records and get them heard on independent radio stations, college radio stations, in magazines and things like that. Yeah. post dinner, you can reach so many more people, but you almost have to do it at a very individual level. Yeah. It, it's like you have to just keep learning over and over again. But at some point, it's like, okay, well, there's a big leap in between sort of maintaining, like basic working class existence. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm doing okay, right? And then we would start to think of being like comfortable or well off. There's much smaller opportunities to do that. And it's also the, the business is shaped a certain way that it's not really meant to support a large amount of people making a comfortable living. That's not what it does, you know? So the like DIY, very appealing, right? Because once you start putting out your own records and doing that and realizing you can reach people, which is also the wonderful thing today is that you can do that. For me, eventually that wasn't sustainable anymore. I couldn't do it. You know, why? You know, because we weren't reaching enough people. We couldn't get enough shows. We couldn't sell enough records, started losing money. You know what I mean? It was fine for a long time, but eventually you get worn out and you get burnt out. So creatively you may get burnt out. So a lot of people I know, they play, but also maybe they teach music or they do work or they produce or they engineer or they're sound men or they're roadies. Like they learn to diversify. And I at some point sort of hit the wall of, of burnout of like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. It's really hard to keep traveling when I keep losing money <laughs> and it's just not working. Like at some point you start to say, maybe I'm not doing it right. Even though my friend is doing it and it's working out for them, but it's not working out for me. So is it like, am I not good? Right. Is it just, not going to work out and and do i want to just stop which a lot of people do right or they just say maybe i'll just play in a cover band or something which is cool uh, and fun and i know some people who do that and they do really cool gigs and play to people or do you stop or do you find some other way to do it and i ended up finding another way but i didn't know what that would be i didn't know it would be a mix of all of these things it just wouldn't it would just be a different shape right isn't really conducive to having a family either, right? So those things start to change. And for a while, I just sort of put that on the back burner and said, almost what you said, I'll just play on the weekends and I'll, I'll have a corporate job. Except now that I have a corporate job, I'm not playing any music anymore. <laughs> and I was really lucky because even though I did that, and we were raising a family, friends of mine would keep pulling me back to play and keep getting me involved in projects and just help support me. And then eventually I, I kind of, created a space for myself to release records, to play people, to record, publish music, get involved in different projects. So the outlet is there, 
Right. And I know, and, uh, we're, and, and never made a lot of money, but you still have that outlet and you still get to share the music with people and sort of create that experience. And that's pretty cool. I wish I would have figured some of that out a long time ago, but younger angsty me was like, I can do it. You hit on something that I think I may have tried to articulate with a couple of guests before who were musicians, but you crystallized it in a way that makes a lot of sense to me. It's the whole, people aren't buying my product, so I must not be good scenario. I haven't encountered that scenario personally as a writer, but I know people who signed major label contracts or potentially got the quote unquote big break and then it didn't happen and I feel like they then either get so discouraged that they decide to change careers or they spend a good chunk of their career being bitter at the people who did make it. Like if you're a singer songwriter with a guitar and for whatever reason, your record didn't do well. And then you see Ed Sheeran come out and he's a dude with a guitar and you feel like you're more talented than in, than Ed Sheeran, but he's incredibly successful and you're not. That's a blow to the ego and that's human nature. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. But how do you keep that from, A, just like messing your soul up and B, how do you keep it from discouraging you from actually making music? Yeah, I think that's really tough. I, I think that it's hard to stay in it if you're susceptible to that or if that really gets to you. I think that we all are that way, though, at some point, but we have to go through the experiences that get us past it or we don't make it, right? So for me, like, I just feel like I've been, I've been really lucky because I started playing when I was a teenager, right? And so some of the guys who are older showed me, like, oh, this is how you book a show. This is how you do a tour. This is how you make a record all of that stuff that would always sort of like give me perspective, right? So like, I felt like I kept trying and trying, but I didn't start to feel like, oh, so-and-so is getting the success. Because part of it was understanding the, the mechanics of all how it worked. Because you could get really frustrated. Like I'd book these shows and, and this tour would go really well and the next tour would go terribly. And then someone else's tour went well. But the more I understood how it worked, the more I realized this is luck of the draw in a lot of ways, right? right? I have friends who have in recent years gotten some good exposure or good gigs or good opportunities. I, I guess I haven't felt that like, oh, I wish it were me. Because if I see them going on some cool tour, I still remember how I felt being on the tours and being like, it's not as much for me as I thought, you know? I get it. What, what do you feel like has been your biggest professional win? Or your biggest win as a musician? The biggest win as a musician. Okay, there's a few. <laughs> so I, I, I really focused in the past few years, right, on songwriting. I felt a lot more energized to work on music. I felt better about my history of playing music and how much I'd learned. I wanted to make a record I was really proud of. And I made a record with several friends of mine. And I just was like, if I make only one more record, what would it be? And I did it. And I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. And a lot of that was that I had these incredibly talented friends who came on and offered to help and they made it more than I ever thought it could be. And then we sold some and then we got reviews, right? And, uh, and then the pandemic happened and it was harder to promote. And even as that happened, I thought, I'm just so happy that this is out. And here we are, it would be a year and a half later since the records come out. And I just got some of my music picked up for a, a radio show in Iowa that's going to be a podcast. Started working with a publisher. Like opportunities keep coming up by doing something. Like just sort of saying, I really want to do something I'm proud of. And then having that happen, you know? So I feel like I originally thought I wanted to be on track and have big records or do whatever. But I'm just really happy with the experiences I've had and the people I've met and been able to work with. And, and nowadays, I, I kind of hope that maybe I can share some of the stuff I've done. And, hey, I know this person. Can I introduce you? Everyone in Dayton is like that, which is really cool. Everyone really helps each other out. It's a good, very good, very healthy, supportive vibe. It's nice to have had some of those experiences. They weren't the ones I expected, and I wouldn't trade any of them. I have a network of people that help me. So I don't necessarily even need to 
especially in this day and age when we can self-release and then we just need to spend money on distribution, public relations thing. I just feel so lucky I can do that and that I am making music and I didn't give up or that my friends didn't give up on me and kept pulling me back when I felt like giving up. So I, I hope I can do that for others too. Yeah, I mean, that speaks very highly to the importance of maintaining relationships. Uh, I think in any sort of, uh, whether it's a creative endeavor or a corporate endeavor, ultimately you get where you get by virtue of who, who you know, probably more so than what you know. You can be the smartest person in the world, but un until you have people to honk the horn for you or champion your cause, you're not really going to get anywhere. Is relationship building something that's always been important to you? Yeah, it's funny you say that because I was just uh, talking to somebody the other day about the same thing. I don't think I've had a job in 10 years that was from a listing. It was all based um, on networking with people I had worked with, plus like a recruiter. So it's like these elements that are out, that element is outside of you. The other element is is working with people. And so when people I know that are looking for our jobs or shifting careers or doing things like that, then I tap into my network because all of these people that we've worked with over the past 20 plus years all end up in these different places. And whether it's tight or loose or whatever, those are sort of the relationships that help each other get to the next spot. I would never have been able to make as much progress in my career or get the opportunities I've been given without it. And it was the same in music too. When I first started, these people would come see us and they're like, hey, you should play with these guys. Or, hey, have you thought about recording this or trying this and, and being willing you know, and, and so developing those friendships and those relationships with people and then remembering that when you go out to places and into the world, that's how it works. I'm pretty sure I grew up thinking I was going to go to college and get a job that I would be in for the rest of my life because that's what my dad did. That's a and, generational thing. And then I'm like, why am I changing jobs every three years? And, and that's been... I won't say exactly three years, but it's because we grow and we progress, right? And that, you, you have to have, build relationships with people to do that, right? I'm not the best designer out there, but do you know how to get the work done? And do you know how to work with people to get the work done? And that becomes more and more important as, as you go on. I mean, my daughter just moved to Chicago now, right? And so she wants to be an artist. She's um, very into the music scene, but she's not playing. And so she got a job at this cool breakfast diner and she's made friends there and now she's joined this photography co-op and she reads about like New York in the 70s when David Byrne and Richard Hell and all those guys were developing this whole like community and she's like I wish that we had that now and I'm like but you do because it's the community you have around you it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be 1975 New York it can be 2021 Chicago you know those movies she gets that as well because she's reading Kim Gordon's biography and and they built that scene around themselves and it grew and grew and became a, a huge thing, right? I mean, record labels couldn't even keep up with, with Sonic Youth, you know? And uh, so I think at the end of the day, it is much less about exactly the skills you have as how you can work with people. Because I work with very talented designers and, and people who write and, and technical people and things like that. And I understand those things, but I sort of have a, a piece of the puzzle and a piece of that relationship puzzle. And it works in the same way in music too, because I've played guitar for a long time now, but I had other people play guitar on the record because there's the sound and the way they thought about stuff was what we were looking for in the song. That was a big thing to say, oh, I'm not gonna play all the instruments on my record, or I'm not even gonna sing on my record. I wrote the songs and now maybe I will sing, but who knows, I'm kind of taking that as like, what could I do next with that? How could I maybe reach out further in terms of like my network of people I work with and maybe get other people involved in being on the record. And that's what the next project is, is to kind of see the pandemic sort of fed that as well, because we're recording things remotely now with people. Right. It's like, hey, my friend in Austin, would he be interested in playing? We can do these things now because we just threw any sort of rules that were left. We could... It was out the window. It's, it, 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 we're kind of doing whatever makes sense. I think that kind of fits in with how I've thought about stuff because it's always been evolving and it's always been influenced by these friends 
and the mentors and the guides that I've met too. They've people have had a big influence on me to like listen to this music or try this thing. It's like learning how to play more progressive or rock, rock by playing with people like that, or learning how to write better songs by, you know, I I, I joined this a friend of mine, Paige Beller, is this amazing, amazing songwriter, and I joined her band as a guitar player, and it was so inspiring. It got me like I really want to try harder at, at writing songs. Like I haven't been applying myself enough, and I, I listened to her songs; they're just so beautiful. It got me moving. I love that. Based on on the things that I've heard from you so far, refreshingly devoid of ego. <laughs> Where did that come from? You're self-aware and you think of others and you're community minded, which I think a lot of people might be in theory, but when it comes to the work, it's kind of like me, 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 me. But you seem like you're very much involved in a we type of situation. I am. And that doesn't mean that I'm void of ego, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, who is? It does certainly help to come from a smaller town. There isn't a competitive nature here. We all know a lot of friends who have gone to bigger towns and can report back on the competitive nature. So we learn that. We're in Midwest. We can go lots of places, you know. So we've got that working class ethic that helps. But I think that the ego pushes you, right, to do things. But I feel like every step of the way, someone has always kind of come in and opened the door and shown me something. And that allowed me to move forward. When I was younger, it was harder to collaborate because I didn't really understand. And the ego is kicking in, right? But maybe we could do your song, Mike, and then we can do my song and we can be in a band together and you have that kind of thing. And maybe we write something together, right? And, and that just kind of kept evolving to the point where I just kept meeting more and more talented people that eventually I'm like, well, I can't quite do that, but can we kind of get together and make something? And at one point I would have shows I would put together with like 10 musicians that didn't know each other, but we'd be playing like all the sort of traditional like roots music or whatever, but they wouldn't know each other and they would get together and play. And I would see those dynamics and maybe we'd write songs afterwards or things like that. And I just really enjoyed it to the point where I thought, at some point, I want that to be a big, like, I want to do two things. I want to be able to be someone who can bring something really strong, right? There's ego right there, right? And I also want to be able to share and give and collaborate and see what happens. And I'm doing a lot of that now. I think there's a lot of value in collaboration. There's a lot of joy in, in collaboration, in community. I, I think I'm going to be using that word until I go blue in the face. Like, community is, is, is really important. But like, I mean, I was in a band once where everybody was way beyond me. But that band existed because I kind of had the idea of the band. I put the band together. I kind of ran it. I made it happen. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm in charge or whatever. I was more like, I'm the facilitator. <laughs> I'm the manager. And it was such a great experience. And I'll tell you what, I became a better player as a result of it. Because you have that sort of thing of like, I got to keep up. Not not competition as much as just like, it just, you got to. It's you, inspiration. Like it's a kick in the butt. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've, I've been very fortunate that I've just, become, you know, making friends with great musicians. And there are so many great musicians in this area. My, a friend of mine moved to Austin to be an upright bass player. And he's like, I'm going to rule this town. And then it's like, wow, there's like. There's 50 other upright bass players in Austin, Texas. You know, and, and it's my friend Josh, he plays in the band called The Sleep at the Wheel. Oh. And, and it took 15 years or whatever, and he got there, and I'm so proud of him. We went and saw him, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe. I thought he was great when he left, you know, and then he paid his dues, he worked his way up in bands, and, and now it's just like, wow, to hear him playing with these legends. That's amazing. <laughs> this is the coolest thing in the world, you know. It's so awesome to hear somebody else, somebody get joy from someone else's accomplishments. It's just like, I think those things are hard to do and they happen in different ways, right? Like, so Josh like travels in a bus and he has a roadie and he, they're at the top of the heap. And then I know other folks who are in bands that are much more DIY and they figure out what works for them. It's great when you find it, when it flows. Right. For all of my friends who are, who are working that hard and doing that and getting the success in the way that like my friend Josh and other friends of mine have had 
I just think that's amazing. Before I hit record, we were talking about your corporate gig and your musician gig and how those sort of live on in, in separate hemispheres almost, but they intermingle sometimes because if someone Googles your name, yeah. it's going to yep. be a musician. Do you deliberately separate those two parts of yourself or is it just like, they're just two things that don't mix? So they don't mix really. They mix in little ways. I keep them separate because I, I don't want people to necessarily, like, I mean, I'm this designer and this strategist and I do those things. And so I don't necessarily want to undercut myself with people who don't really understand. So most of the time when people find out about it, it's when I get hired or you just sort of stumble upon it. It turns out that someone else's boyfriend or girlfriend is in a band. I think people in, appreciate it and enjoy it, but I also don't want to be like, hey, buy my record. I'd rather people, if they're curious, check it out because it's not for everybody, right? People will hear it and be like, oh, that's neat. Their level of engagement may be sure. Sure. No, totally fine, you know, or they just rather not. And I don't want to push that on them. And I don't want to distract because I work with a lot of people and maybe it's more of their life than it is for me. I used to work in a company that did legal research. So you had people who had law degrees. So maybe they're more invested. That's a thing that's a little more central to their life. I don't really want to provide that distraction. I don't shy away from it, but I don't want it to distract. I'm comfortable with it, right? But I don't want it to be getting in the way or something. I, I find that interesting, particularly because we're, we're now in an era when everybody's got more than one gig and people are definitely leaning into creative pursuits. So it's like everybody's got a side hustle now. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like you're going to see a lot more, I don't know, a lot more physician's assistants who are musicians or, or have written plays. There's not this secretive nature of, oh, by the way, I also play music. Yeah, that's true. I think it's a matter of whether I'm open to sharing it. I think that's totally cool. I'd love to hear about people's side hustles. I know people who design jewelry. I'm like, show me the, let me see what you're yeah. doing. But I think it just deepens the connection between people. I mean, we're all on Zoom and Teams and Skype these days, and we all have meetings and they're all 30 minutes long and they have an agenda and we have 10 of them a day or whatever. And it's like very transactional kind of relationships. And when we kind of can deepen them a little bit, it helps us work together. It helps us it, yeah, yeah. It, it separates you kind of, instead of Nick, that guy who was in the upper right-hand corner of the Zoom screen, you're Nick, the guy who's a musician. It doesn't have to be, oh, I like his album. Right. As much yeah. as I like it to be, and he bought my, I bought his album, it was so good. <laughs> I'm going to buy 10 copies from my friends. No, I have a few people who have said like, oh, I really like the, you know, I like the music. It's like, awesome. Because that feeling never gets old of someone actually hearing a song and saying that they they liked it or they related to it. That's the best, you know? So it's just a feeling of accomplishment and of connection because I feel that when I hear people's music, it just really affects me. I love that fact. I can still get that same feeling I got with a kid, whether it's lyrics or a melody or a sound. And so it's nice. I'm not out looking for people to say it, but it's like, it's nice when people do, right? That they, yeah. that they connected with it, so. Is music also a self-soothing thing for you? Is it something that, is it a way to practice self-care, whether it's listening to music or playing music or both? It definitely is. Playing music is definitely important in maintaining my mental health and my balance and to keep from being too stressed and anxious. But I don't mean like singing, oh, woe is me. Right. Just communicating and, and even if it could be for myself or out into the, the world. But listening to it as, as well, especially as moving or, you know, whether you hear a Leonard Cohen song and it's intense or whether you get surprised by something like, whoa, that just grabbed me. So, yeah, I think it's very important in terms of overall mental health, emotional well-being. I think it's been the thing that's been my center. I've always come back to, even when I wandered away from it, like in the end, I, I drifted back in some way and it doesn't have to be the way I thought it was when I was younger. And it was like, oh, it must be this way to be successful. And it took a while to figure that out. If I had figured that out earlier, I would have spent more time writing songs and less time maybe trying to book shows and travel. And I spent a lot of time doing that. I'm not saying I regret that. I don't think I could have written songs I'm writing now back then. Sure. But 
of this stuff. But it's also been something of the more I put into it, the better I feel. And the better I feel I relate to other people too. There's not a day that goes by that I don't play. Unfortunately, I can't practice for hours a day, I wish. But I do make the time. I, I, I have a weird routine. I get up at 5 a.m. and I, that gives me time. I know. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm shaking my head vigorously at this, this 5 a.m. thing that I am quite unfamiliar with. This is only like in the past three years. I realized that if I basically had a 5 a.m. to 10 a.m., I, what happened? I slept better. My diet was better. I had more time to exercise and to meditate. I had more time to read. I had more time to write because that was the impetus for it. It was like, I need to devote time to write. And my kids are teens. I work a job, you know, work 10 hours a day or whatever. So like, when am I going to do it? And then it just turned out to just work. I'm better balanced for it. Now I can still go out to a show and stay out late, but I just need to prepare <laughs> and recover. But hey, we all are that way since this pandemic. We're all yes. right. So like walk me through the alarm rings. It's 5 a.m. It opens okay. my eyes. I open my eyes. I, you know, I wake up and I'm like, joy. You know, I, I am. I'm what yeah, yeah, I know. Are you one of those people? I have gotten a lot of a lot of shit from friends of mine because I am also one of those people. Okay. And like the whole, you know, uh, taking ninety minutes to actually like be a version of yourself that doesn't like click with me. I'm pretty much give me like five minutes and I'll be me. Give me. I need five minutes to get downstairs. My whole family is exactly like that too. They're slower to wake up. And okay. Like, but for me, I get downstairs, I turn the coffee on, which is always made the night before. And then I get out my journal and I try not to turn the phone on. I try not to look at the phone for at least a couple hours. Good man. I, I don't like start doing jumping jacks right away or anything, but, but I get up and I just keep it kind of chilled out and I really enjoy a slow cup of coffee. And then maybe I read a little bit or if I feel like writing, I'll write a little bit. And then maybe I'll play a little music or I'll start working on some music. And then I'll go for a walk, go for a hike or you know, exercise, like some combination of those things and then eat. And then I'm like ready by, by 7.30. That's like two or three hours. And, yeah. then I'm and what it is, is like, even if you didn't write anything or even if the scales didn't work out, a lot of it is just showing up, right? And for me, it's not ultra discipline because I'm not good at that. It's like keep showing up and it's going to work. You have to keep priming the pump, right? And do that. And sometimes it's, it's nothing. And sometimes it's a song or maybe it's a melody idea, but I kind of leave myself open to that possibility. And if it's not working, maybe I walk longer or maybe I read a little more, but I also give myself some of that time too, because it's harder to do than when you go in and you talk to people all day. 10 hours and then you're done and you eat and you do the dishes and you watch Dexter and you read in the evening. So my day, I guess you would say is kind of front loaded. It's a program and it's worked and it's been really good for managing my ups and downs. It's, it's just really helped. Was there something that brought you to that place or, or was it just kind of like, this is trial and error. I'm getting older. This is maybe something that I need to do. I was having a lot of sleep issues. I was having a lot of insomnia for a long time. And I was having just different health issues, like stomach issues and things like that. And I was still coming off of doing quite a bit of traveling and was feeling depressed, was feeling really anxious and was having a lot of trouble controlling that. And through a combination of, and talking through some of that, it was still resolving it. Part of it was at the time, so much work, family, you know, I mean, I had gotten away from giving myself some creative time. And so I wanted that back. And so I tried staying up late at night and it wouldn't work. And I was, again, insomnia, feeling depressed, you know, like all of those things. And so we kind of flipped it at the same time as I was like, I really want to work. Like, I'm ready to dedicate myself. How could I do it differently? And that's how we came up with it. And then I had improved my diet, stopped eating meat, things like that. So mental health was improving. But it's just weird. It just clicked. I, know, I didn't think it was going to work. But sure enough, you know. And But again, like you, right? Like, we're people who kind of get up. So you could probably get up at whatever time you want. It's I could. I've fallen into bad habits since we shut down for COVID and I sleep way more than I used to. Not five in the morning, but I was getting up at six or 6.30 uh, okay. when I 
was commuting on a regular basis. Even when I was a kid, I was up at five or six in the morning and, and my folks would actually like, you have to stay in your room until a certain time because you're not waking the rest of us up with you. Right. Um, I was that uh, way. Yeah, but now it's, it's kind of like, if you're working from home, it's like, oh, I don't have to get up until it's time to start working. I've fallen out of the good habit of getting up when I should get up as opposed to when I can get up, I guess. I know a lot of people struggle with that too. And then when you eliminate that commute, it is nice to know that you can just get up and roll right into doing what you do. I had that too, but I also would start work really early, like stupid early. I kind of felt very out of balance because at the same time, Kathy and I want to be able to spend time together, you know, and the kids as well. And of course the kids have their schedule. It's like trying to find that balance. You have to get kind of creative. But the thing is, is like when you write songs or when you play, it's like, there's times when you're just like, okay, stop. I got to do this when it hits and you just move it all out of your way. Right. So my hope was to maybe set aside some time that I could, it's self care but also being creative. Am I going to write a song at 5 a.m.? I don't know. I might just have a cup of coffee. But you know what happens at other times of the day, of other days of the week, of other, you know, like, it's like ideas come to you. Mm -hmm. Make time to work on them, and it's a little more natural. Hey, I, I just finished work. I'm going to spend a half hour. I'm going to work on this song, and then I'll get dinner ready. Because you just start getting it more into that that rhythm. And that's kind of what I wanted. I'm not saying it's like, oh, amazing inspiration. I just like doing it. I like the process. I like the iteration through things. And so I want to spend time doing that. And if I could spend more, I would. But, you know, there's only so much time. There's only 24 hours in a day. And you have a job. And you have two children and, and a wife. And... and there's only so many things going on in my head. Too. Right. I used to have tons and tons of time to work on stuff. And I wasn't as productive even when i could just sit there and work or we practice three days a week or whatever that doesn't always lead i mean at certain times it does but it doesn't always mean more hours don't always mean that it more it mostly means prioritizing i think and that goes for all of those things is just kind of making space and prioritizing it i'm not an ultra disciplined person it's just very hard for me to be militant about it so it's trying to find like an ease and a flow. I think there's something to be said for not kicking your own ass when you don't do things sometimes. Like giving yourself the space to be like, okay, well today I'm just gonna drink my coffee and chill. Yeah, it's all part of the bigger picture. I didn't know that for a long time, for 20 years. I just thought if I don't work as many hours as I can, as hard as I possibly can, I will, be, I'm toast, I'm over, you know? And then it's just stuff starts suffering. You know, so now I am very careful about my work hours. And hey, if I don't deliver at the, like, I mean, I need to deliver at a certain rate. I mean, we do, right? We are expected to deliver. Then I'm going to have to make that up. But I don't have to work 12 hours a day to be able to deliver what they are paying me to deliver. Not I'm talking about punching a clock. I'm talking about like delivering, like being valuable. Right. I used to think I had to do that six days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. And I available to... nights, weekends. Oh yeah. It was horrible for my health, my mental health, my physical health it was horrible, you know? And it took me a long time to learn that. And music suffered my family. I mean, I've ever, everything. So my friendships suffered, family suffered. And so I, I, I guess I'm happy that I've learned how to do that, where I feel like I can still go and I can do a good job, but I can also have that space for myself. Cause a long time I didn't think I could. So. That was kind of leading to, to uh, this question, which is, you talk so much about the value of community in, in your careers. Is, is that also something that's been really important to you as part of your personal life? Well, yeah, I mean, definitely. So for one thing, like, I've been really lucky in that I had, you know, friends growing up, but when I started playing shows in clubs when I was a teenager, you start meeting people who are older and, and, and then going into college and it's like kind of growing it from there is like, I just feel so fortunate. I've met this community of really wonderful people that have like been great role models and influences over my life. And some of those people I've been friends with for a very long time. And maybe we've been in bands or maybe we collaborated and maybe we ended up working together somewhere or we've gone through these different stages as parents as similar experiences over time. And it's a really cool thing. And I think it's especially cool being in a creative space. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's been critical. Yeah. To good health, 
and happiness is having that. And, and some of those are people I've known, you know, 20, 30 years, and some people I've just known for a few years, right? But it's like we're all getting on the same train or something. It's a cool thing, really cool thing. Is that unique here? I do think Dayton's kind of unique in a way. Like something's going on here. I don't know, if, but that could be the same in every town because you hear all these other cities that have like these vibrant arts communities, and we all think Minneapolis, Athens, Georgia. Right. Seattle or you know in these like you know cool towns but it's like hey Spin Magazine wrote about Dayton Ohio a couple times back in the day there was that long period of time where people started thinking about the next big town or whatever but it's not but it's like that's looking at it from the outside it's like you create your own space wherever you are so ultimately if you don't have that space here maybe you go in search of your space right and you create it and I have friends who have done that, New York, Nashville, Austin, Chicago, and they've created great opportunities for themselves, you know? But it, to me, it always seems like it's immersing yourself in a community and in friendships and the relationships that we talked about. You know, I've played some bad shows and I've written some bad songs and I can prove it, you know? So, it's so, all subjective. Well, but the thing is, this community I've been in has been incredibly supportive, right? I, I work in an environment where you can mess up like in my job, you can mess up and you, and people will catch you and keep you going. It's not like a three strikes you're out kind of thing. They're supportive of that. In this, so you asked about art, I think in that being willing to be vulnerable and share that then and, and have people embrace it is like, <gasps> you know, you're going to be hooked. That's a, an important way for people to relate to each other. Now, I might be overthinking all of that, but I do know that by sharing yourself, you're also sharing what other people are doing. You're also taking it in at the same time, right? By being willing to be more vulnerable, you're also being willing to accept people or support people, right? Like that investment is what separates the artists from the insurance salespeople. I'd agree with you there. Yeah, just, so I was in a company that did legal research. I worked with a lot of lawyers and it was really interesting because it's a complicated domain, right? And so I would usually partner with somebody who had went to law school and we'd go and interview other attorneys and things like that. And I was like, my head's spinning. And yet they knew it. And there was a whole flow. And it, it was almost like art in a way of how the law evolves and the arguments of the law and how people position things and deal with things. So maybe it's like that too. Yeah. Maybe like doctors, it's science, but is there not an art in some there way? Art, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. 100% yeah. there's an art to it. And far beyond my, but are they, are they in a zone? I mean, they have such knowledge and experience that's, that blows my mind. I really ad admire that, that sort of ability, whether it's natural or learned or combination, it's all a combination, right? Right. Direct and indirect experience. I just think that's a amazing thing. Yeah. So who's, that's not in all these other spaces in life as well, too. I just don't think about it then. Maybe I should think about people a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, it's putting yourself in the position of someone else and maybe thinking, what is it that they do? Or how is it that they come to what it is that they do? And yeah. realizing that there is art and theater in a lot of a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. Expression. Yes. You know, but, and that's like what I'm saying and to think about. And again, you kind of bring that back to now, does it make him more of a person? Well, it makes him... A, it makes their personish and personage. It makes their, their them as a human more apparent. I knew what you were getting at. Of that, you're more aware of that, right? As opposed to a kind of a more of a, of a transactional nine to five relationship that we have with dozens and dozens of people. Yeah, it gives them. It makes them fuller. It's yeah. not like this person. This is the mailman. This is the person at the supermarket who checks out my groceries. This is my doctor. But yeah. then when you find out that your doctor like is into comic books or your male person is into abstract art or whatever, it it then they go from being this is the person that fulfills this function for me to right. this insert name here, you know, comma, a person who likes this, 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 and this thing. Right. We realize we're just automatically framing these people. We're, we're putting them in roles. Yeah that serve us, I guess. Why aren't we always that way? Why don't we realize that that's like a brilliant human being down the street that's delivering the mail? I do this at work too, because we do get into our lanes and our roles. And it is my job to like 
seek out creative solutions and different ideas and ways to approach things. So I like to break the ice, whether there's an icebreaker in the meeting or not. I like to be like, hey, how's it going today? Or or throw something out or look for opportunities to just mix it up a little bit. Okay. So enjoy doing that. I think it's a good thing to just try to kind of keep from limiting our experience with people or limiting people because then it gets even harder to understand why people feel the way they do these days mm -hmm. about politics and, and public health. Not that you're going to agree with them or see their side, but it's just to understand that they're people dealing with things like fear. Right. And because I'm dealing with fear, I, I, am I not scared of stuff? Sure, I'm scared of stuff, you know. So they're scared of stuff too, or they're misunderstanding stuff. I'm misunderstanding stuff too. I, I Maybe I've thought about that more in the past few years as we've seen every, everything just get so intense, you know. It's just something I've been kind of thinking about. It's completely food for thought. It actually made me think about some of us never get out of the stage where we're kids and we see our teachers at the supermarket or something like that. And you're like, you're supposed to be in a classroom, Mr. or Mrs. What's your name? Like, you're not supposed to do normal people things. Yeah. The teacher thing is a perfect example of that. Like, I'm just like out of the element. And it's like, I don't know. I like that. I can't tell you how many times those have led to discussions that have led to job opportunities or connections or gigs or learning about a band or all sorts of stuff that's en enriching. And, and it, it's sad that we all had to go heads down and isolate and hide under the bed for so long too, because then you come out and you're a little gun shy of- And you know, you're afraid of everything. I kind of felt some social anxiety in the recent years anyway of, of being out. And some of that was, being more isolated, working more, you know, and then like getting away from being out and social and playing and all of that stuff, playing once a month or in town and playing several shows a month, traveling and then sort of getting back into it. And as I got back into it, I was like, whoa, it feel, feels a little overwhelming and um, sort of learning how to do that. And then we all go back into isolation and now we're back. And so we went to a show the other night and after a few hours, I'm like, Okay, my introvert extrovert balance needs to be recalibrated or whatever. <laughs> my learned extrovert is exhausted. And that, <laughs> to... That's also an important thing to realize for people, and I think you and I are alike in that sense, where we have the option, like the extrovert button can be turned on, it can be activated, but it is not the default button. Right. Yeah. I think. I think it's because I'm a, I'm a pretty high energy, seemingly naturally naturally caffeinated person, and I'm an enthusiastic person, and I'm a cheerleader for people. I did the personality test. I'm a cheerleader, but it's not that's not how I, like I go to a situation like what you were saying before about when you're in an environment, you have to kind of like understand the personalities and kind of adjust and work with that. Well, that's kind of for me too because I kind of want to go there and want to be part of it, but that's not where I am all the time. Right. You know, so, I mean, yes, naturally caffeinated, but not, you know, like, it's just sort of part about doing what you want to do, being able to do what you want to do. But yeah, got to, after a little while, then got to strike the balance and recharge too. And I've found that I need more of that time than I thought to be, you know, like I could get myself too, too worn out. Try And then am I just trying to please people or try to keep things going? But it's like, no, I actually need to peace out for a little bit, you know, and that's okay. I should be able to do that. You know? yeah. <laughs> Otherwise I'm going to be cranky. <laughs> I, and that's me. It's like, okay, either I'm going to take my time or you're not going to like me very much in, in this next installment. <laughs> <laughs> this next heads up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. And I do that. I don't want to be snapping or, you know, I mean, it's just like time to kind of get out of here. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, dial it back. Yeah. So. And my wife understands that too, you know? So, I mean, well, she's gotten used to me over the years, but yeah, it's I like- I assume that if you've been married for a long period of time that you eventually figure out personality buttons. Yeah, well, we just celebrated 23 years, you know? And a lot of that is through evolving through all of those experiences, right? But it's nice to be able to also not feel like, like we were out and it was getting late and I'm like, I think I'm done. You know, and it really could have been like, hey, she could have stayed with her friends or she could have left. I mean, we could have left together, whatever. It's like, it's kind of very comfortable with like, what do you need? What do I need? And, you know, like, that's nice. It's nice to, to know you can do that because otherwise you kind of like then may feel obligated or right. you may feel 
and I am someone who will feel like, oh, I shouldn't leave, I should stay, you know, that they would like it. <laughs> so, but I want to go home. <laughs> hey, how do you how do you make it work happily and successfully? Twenty three years in. I mean, there is kind of an answer to that, but the thing is, the situation changes over. You know, I mean you get married and that's one thing, but then you have a baby and then, oh my gosh, you have two babies, you know? And so then you're in baby land for, you know, and then all of a sudden I've got, I've got like a young adult. I'm, like my son is as tall as I am. He weighs more than I did as a teen, you know? My daughter is like 20 years old and she's living in Chicago now. You know, like, so like we've just gone through this whole thing. So I think it's this, it's like an ongoing communication and consideration like, I almost think it's more consideration than communication because you can't communicate without considering where that person is at all times, right? right. Because you're not going to be able to communicate the consideration you need unless you're understanding them. That is not a problem solved after 23 years. That is an ongoing thing because we change as people. We're different than we used to be. Sure. He is still the same wonderful person, but also so much more too because we've had these experiences and she's had these experiences and we've learned we hope we've evolved as people and learned things that we didn't quite know when we were younger because of our upbringing and so i think a lot of that is 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 just relating to that other person and what they need like for me like if there's problems i always want to solve them well guess what <laughs> problem can be solved my man Right, but Kathy doesn't want me to solve the problem. She wants me to listen. Because by sharing what's going on with her, by externalizing it, then she gets to figure things out. She doesn't need me continually putting things in. But I love what we call ideation at work, or I think that creative process, I love that. And uh, a lot of my friends are like that. And we're all just like, woo, 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 all this stuff. And, and good ideas come out of it. So I'm in that mode. And then, of course, if something's wrong, I want to fix it. Sure. It's just like a different, you know, it's like just because that's the way I communicate does not mean that's the style of communication that's needed in that answer. So like I said, we're always kind of learning and it starts with not communicating. It starts with actually maybe not communicating, right? <laughs> and and listening and, and considering what's going on. I think that's the biggest thing. And that's a changing thing over time too. It's very different than, you know, when we were in the throes of, dealing with kids right and now we're in the throes of these young adults or about to become young adults yeah you know, teaching them to drive and moving them to other cities and stuff like that it continues to evolve yeah. and actually here we are about to be empty nesters in a few years and i find myself almost like moving towards that and my and kathy's like whoa whoa let's not don't forget your son's here we're still having these experiences just because like lily's moved out and it's a sort of momentum things where it's like yeah let's stay here and now right in the moment that right now your son is behind the wheel learning how to drive right yes not the time to drift off at all well and also like what i found is like as like my kids have become teenagers because the kid years are so fun as teenagers then and they develop their own identities and opinions and they don't always agree with you sometimes they firmly disagree you know, and I think sometimes we forget that, like how excited we got as kids, like when we first became politically aware and how like earnest, like how intense we oh, yeah. things and oh, they're yeah. going through those things as well. And in some ways doing a lot better than I probably did at the time because they're more enlightened. There's, you know, it, it's crazy to think that 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, there's been so much knowledge, so much, the world has evolved to the degree that it has evolved. You know, thanks, I think, in large part to technology and the ability to gain the perspective of someone on the opposite side of the world from you without reading it in a book or placing a long distance call. Yeah, yeah. Or having a pen pal. Yeah, I know like going maybe to another country and working with somebody face to face, like what an eye opening experience I was yeah. being able to be around in other cultures, but now being able to reach out and as like establish relationships and learn from other people in that way is not only like from an intellectual standpoint, but from like, a, like an emotional and a cultural standpoint for us to become 
you know, more understanding of, of people and more accepting and, and, and opening our minds more, their perspective on things and how things have changed and socially and um, emotionally and sexually, and they're just right there with it. But for a lot of us, we've had to sort of learn and catch up, right? Because things move ahead and we're all learning and evolving. But technology has created this sort of, you know, it's like, there's no reason why you can't really like learn more or expose yourself more. At the same time, it's also coming at you, right? And it's like, why do we know the same things that our kids do, but our kids are just in the flow with it so much more, you know? And my daughter's definitely corrects me all of the time. So I'm working on it. I'm working. It's, it's the rate of information. And again, it's just language that, you know, when I was 20 or 25, I could conceptualize something like white privilege, but mm -hmm. the words white privilege or the terminology white privilege was something that was foreign to me. You know, when you, you know, the, the terminology of someone being gender non-binary in an objective way might, I might have understood 15 or 20 years ago, but I didn't have the language for it. And now the language exists for it and I can conceptualize it in a much easier fashion. Yeah. Uh, you know, what folks who are 25 and under really or 30 and under have is the fact that they've grown up with this language i agree completely it's like maybe understood conceptually but it wasn't necessarily in the working language that we had or um as visible and we are having to learn as it goes i mean, i think that's amazing in terms of how that like we all have the opportunity to really grow as a result Trying, trying to. Yeah, I mean, we should be taking advantage of, of those opportunities. And really embracing it. And I do think people can be very overwhelmed by it. Like I've talked to people who get very overwhelmed. And I'm like, I don't really think you I get to be, actually get to be overwhelmed. You don't get to opt out. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, the world, the world moves forward whether you want it to or not. And we can't necessarily manage every injustice in the world, but we have yeah. no excuse for not being aware and being able to... I guess, live accordingly, to do what we can. And we can't do everything. And sometimes we're gonna feel maybe not good about ourselves. That we, it's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe like, I'm not doing enough or I can't play. I think last year when my daughter was out there marching and getting tear gassed, you know, I wasn't, you know? So it's like, should I go? Should I not go? She just rushed right out, you know? And I had to think about it, you know? And then, then I've got to like, you know, second guess those decisions and figure out, you know, like, and eventually then maybe find my own way, yeah, to, find your own way to deal with it. Yeah. To, to do your, I mean, activism takes many different forms. Right. Right. It's easy to not get in, involved or at least not just apply yourself. It seems like a long time ago when I wasn't able to donate money to causes, like we had a lot of activism around here to where we would do benefit shows and raise money, right? Whether it's for uh, Amnesty International or for a, a food bank. So I try to kind of think about that too. It's like, in what ways can we do things, but also like, we can't do everything. So what can we do? Yeah. And there, there, there are things like, like at work, we do volunteer days, right? That people have told me, they're kind of relating the same thing. They're like, I feel like, what can I do? And I'm like, well, you get four days a year that you can go and volunteer for whatever you want. And we have a ton of causes that we support. And, and it's, it's like, that's leveraging a huge corporation's money mm -hmm. to go for something that either you want to do or something that we already support, some charity we already support. And I can donate money from record sales. There's no shortage of things. It's every, you know, what I'm saying though is like, there's no, it doesn't, I'm not saying march, donate or anything. I'm saying there's no real reason to, you don't get to opt out. Right. Okay. There's no reason to not do anything. Right. It's like, I mean, but it's also but the food you buy, the, the, the money, where you voting and spending money. It's like the more you, and I talk to friends about this too, and they, it's like more and more these days where people are like trying to like think more about where, who they're buying from. Mm -hmm. Things Because that's where all, all of our money is going to the stuff we're buying. Are we buying things that are, I don't, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole there, but it's oh. like, you're, yeah, I, you know, I am, I am, what is it? I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> it's, 
that's a work in progress too though it's like i became a vegetarian for health reasons but is it like good that i'm contributing less to you know the meat industry <laughs> you know it's like i mean it's like yeah sure you know but is it like you know like are there better places you know like buying local or there's just ways that we can figure out how to do that but at the same time i got to feed these teenagers who are eating like crazy <laughs> i do still order from amazon could i find alternatives to amazon yes do i yes do i still order from amazon yes can you you can edit that out too right <laughs> I, mean, I order from amazon so i'll go down that hole with you yeah yeah i mean it's just I like, don't like it yeah but you got to get some stuff done yeah. too and it doesn't help that, you know, every brick in the wall, it's like, it's harder to get other places. But you know, I would say Kathy and I are more actively looking for alternative places to order from too than we used to. We probably were just ordering blindly from Amazon all the time. Yeah. Christmas, Amazon is core for Christmas. But yeah. if I want to get a book or, or a CD to somebody quickly, then Amazon's my delivery system. Yeah, that's what you got to do. That's what yeah. You we figure it out. I think that the point, though, is like technology has given us the opportunity that we don't, we can't willfully look away. Right. We can't like put our head in the sand. Yeah, you can't put your head in the sand at all. It like, can, yeah. It can be too much sometimes be, to keep up with everything, but it's like it's there. You do it in that, you do it in your own time, just like anything, education, right? But it's like you can't ignore or deny. Thank you, Nick, for uh, sharing your story with us. I appreciate your thoughts and uh, wish you much success in the future. Folks, if you are interested in Nick Kazernis' music, you can find him on just about every social media website at his name. That is N-I-C-K-K-I-Z-I-R-N-I-S. Also, feel free to go to nickkazernis.com or check out his Bandcamp if you want to hear his music. Better to go to Bandcamp than go to Spotify because the artist gets a much bigger cut of the money there. So check them out. And thanks again. Hey, y'all. It's me again. Just reminding you to please smash that subscribe button if you want to keep listening to this show. Leave a comment. Rate us. Whatever you can to push us up in the rankings. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, if you love the podcast, if you would like to be on the podcast... If you know somebody who is interested in being on the podcast or who would be a good fit to talk about masculinity, please feel free to reach out to me via my social media channels. I am on Instagram as DetoxPodGuy, and I am on Twitter at TizMikeJoseph. You can even drop me an email, old school style, DetoxPod at gmail.com. By the way, not hating on anybody who still sends emails. I am old school proudly, and I send emails all the time. Uh, Detoxicity is produced and hosted by myself, Mike Joseph. Uh, the music for this podcast was written, composed, and performed by Calvin Williams. The logo for this show was designed by uh, Jacob Block. And I want to give a special shout out to Andrew Grossman and Jeff Giles for the inspiration to create this podcast. Uh, I thank you all for listening and hope that you're all keeping yourselves and each other safe out there. Take care. Peace.